Thank you, Rakesh. So today I'm here to talk to you about what is disease, but before I begin, I'd like to tell you a personal story as to what brings me here. 20 years ago in Pakistan, my aunt attempted suicide by hanging herself following what was classified as a nervous breakdown. As a 15-year-old child, I witnessed firsthand the consequences of mental illness on my aunt, on my family. I watched as society chose to stigmatize my aunt, but also my family. And as a consequence of her illness, she has never recovered. The hypoxia that that caused to her brain makes sure that she lives in a state of mismanaged psychosis to this day, ignored and sidelined by society. It's almost 2020, and I wonder if we're actually any further ahead. Have we found a way to define disease where we can prevent these things? This year, I lost a 35-year-old friend to esophageal cancer, and another friend, a 65-year-old colleague, to cancer metastases from breast cancer. I'm sure every one of us has a similar story to tell. So I continuously ask myself, why are we not better at preventing, diagnosing, and treating disease. Merck is a phenomenal company, 350 years, and this industry has not stood still. It is innovations from this sector, the life sciences industry, that allowed someone who had breast cancer to survive five years, be with her children, before she went on to pass away from breast cancer metastases. But this industry does have its challenges. It is very expensive to bring a drug to market. 2.6 billion pounds, a very long time, will get one drug to market, and it's not getting any easier. The life sciences industry has not stood still, but these numbers are scary because we're doing something very hard. Despite these numbers, we actually have a high rate of non-efficacious drugs, 40% of drugs for asthma patients don't work in asthma. And so, have we actually just not defined asthma correctly? What is it? Is the 40% of people that are not responding actually a different disease altogether? So, no codex talk or any other talk when you're asking a question like what is X or Y is complete without a definition from a dictionary. Merriam-Webster defines disease quite interestingly in black and white, as talking about signs and symptoms. And so we define disease today by saying you have the onset of symptom A, B, C, or D. But actually, if we are to prevent disease, we have to pick it up before the symptoms have been on, on, onset. When we think about building a drug for a certain disease, as a biologist, I think about targeting a pathway. I target a mechanism. I do a knockout in a cell line, and I look at a very specific target. And so how is it that when I actually talk about treating disease and targeting a mechanism, but we're defining disease by symptomology, shouldn't we actually be defining disease by mechanism? And why is it that we continue down this path of defining disease by symptoms? So what is it that we do? Let's say I have inflammatory bowel disease. Let's say I actually am suffering the symptoms. I go on, I see a GP, they diagnose me, I get what we call an ICD code, an international classification of disease code for ICD. That determines my entire treatment cycle. I'm allowed to get the drugs that are allowed for that disease. I will go through first-line therapy, I will go through second-line therapy. And the, the most phenomenal thing, I was talking to one of the clinicians, um, a, a clinician for inflammatory bowel disease, 30% of patients do not respond to third-line therapy for IBD. So do they actually have IBD? Do they have inflammatory bowel disease, or is it something else altogether? And because we've defined it in signs and symptoms, we've classified it as IBD. But I don't think that's what it is. So if today we started with all of the technology we had to us today, if we had machine learning, we have genomics, transcriptomics, multiomics, stem cells, CRISPR, all of the technology that's being developed at Merck, is this how we would define disease? 
And actually, is that how we would run drug discovery? At Sunshine Health, we do things a little bit differently, and we're trying to approach things differently as, as a young company that's trying to innovate in this space. We take a different approach, and instead of going from the bench to the bedside, we want to go from the bedside to the bench. The classical drug discovery process is we find a target, we find a gene, and we say we're going to build a molecule, the molecule's going to be really specific, we're going to put it in a patient, we're going to look at patient stratification, we're going to hope it works, and it works in about 5% of the cases. But what if we turn that around? What if we said, actually, I know all of the blood work, and I know all of the medications that a patient is on. Why can't I define my disease and then start looking at how the mechanisms are influenced in that disease. So an example of that would be something like this. If you have IBD, we have access now because of big data and across many, many countries, the demographics of those patients, the vital signs of those patients, the encounters of those patients. Later today, you'll hear about a digital twin. You have access to large swaths of data for any given person. In the future, you will have their WG whole genome sequences. You will have their ECGs coming from their phone. All of this data, the human body is going to be the most powerful data generation machine that exists. Today, we have access to electronic health records and machine learning. What we do in my team is we combine these two things and we actually don't define disease anymore, we define endotypes. So what we, the way we look at this problem is we say, actually what I'm most interested in is how is IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, actually how many diseases are sitting in there? And we define those endotypes to be able to study them further. So instead of IBD, you're either a responder or a not responder. And so now that I've classified that, I'd like to think about how can we study this further and what disease models can we use? So the next thing, the, the humongous innovation that has happened, and, and actually doesn't get talked about enough, I feel, because I get very excited about this, is stem cells. From any given patient, from me, from you, we can take a skin bi biopsy and I can make an infinite number of stem cells. With those stem cells, I can make neural cells, I can make brains in a dish, I can make guts in a dish, I can make hepatocytes in a dish, and actually, we can make an infinite number of cells. So instead of actually studying my target or my gene in a cell line, I can now study everything in patient-derived cells. So the question, what, if, what is disease and drug discovery going to look like in 20 years? I think we're not going to be defining disease anymore. I don't think we're going to have inflammatory bowel disease. I think we have to go to a mechanism-based definition of disease. I really hope we have moved away from the models that exist today. So an example could be that if you want to start a drug discovery and development process, you actually start with the patient outcomes. You start with what matters, and the patient outcomes are what matter. How someone responds, their trajectory, how they're feeling, and the entire plethora of information that is available to you for someone suffering for a specific disease. Based on that, you actually go and use the patient samples to determine what is important, and you link those two things. Currently, when I run an experiment, the outcome of that experiment has absolutely no link to the outcome in the patient. When I do my experiment in the bench, and what happens on the bedside is disconnected. It doesn't have to be disconnected. The patient data that is used to define the actual question can be the same patient samples that are used to answer the question. Can you imagine a world whereby we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of banked stem cells that are linked to the patient outcomes? So when I run my high throughput screen for compounds and I identify a new gene or a new target, I can actually go and query exactly what outcomes those patients are having. I can go and ask, how are these people responding to the drugs that are on the market? 
So what is it that drug discovery is going to be in 20 years? I think we're not going to be looking at disease. I want to move away from a world where we classify people as patients or non-patients. We are all going to suffer from a disease, and that shouldn't make us any less human. I think we need to think about deconstructing how we do things in drug discovery today, and it's only organizations like this that can use innovation and change the way we do drug discovery that is going to allow us to, to change the way we define disease. I'm not one of those healthcare AI utopians that's going to come here and tell you I have a solution. I'm definitely not going to tell you that AI is going to help us understand biology better. Biology is incredibly messy. We don't understand most of the diseases. And most importantly, I think there is a need for large organizations like this that, need, that understand the pains that it takes to get a drug to market to innovate, to be able to do this together. My motivation for what I do is to allow us to think about disease differently, to unlock and drive discovery in a different way. Personally, I want to make sure we can intervene early enough for anyone who feels like they should take their life. Above all, I think we need to redefine disease, remove the stigma, not only from mental illness, but from disease in general. Most importantly, I share the passion and the vision for the people in this room is to innovate, to save and improve lives. Thank you.